I am not only at the MSME department, I'm also at the Center um, for Financial Risk Analytics. And let me first introduce the Center. So what we are doing, we are working with big financial data sets. Uh, big financial data sets can be high frequency data, big mortgage data sets, order book data, tax data, etc. And we are trying to understand better how we can use this data. So we think there are huge potential opportunities for analyzing these data sets, but it's challenging from a computational and statistical perspective. So what we are going to do at the Center for um, um, Financial and Risk Analytics we are combining research in finance, statistics, and computational methods to help better analyze these big data sets. And I will present you two examples of our work. I'm uh, working on factor modeling, as I mentioned before. And I'm trying to understand time variation and systematic factors using high frequency data. That's one project. And I'm also trying to understand better how we can model asset prices and explain why do certain assets have different prices if we use large data sets of stock prices. Kai is working on credit risk data. He has a huge mortgage data set, which he's analyzing using machine learning techniques to understand and put, give us more insights in how the financial crisis has unfolded. So what am I doing? So I think one of the most important questions in finance is to understand why do certain assets have a different price than other assets. And the idea that we have is that different assets have different exposure to risk. If you have more risk, you earn a higher risk premium, and that's why you have a different price. Now, this risk can be modeled in a very general way using factors. If you're exposed to more factor risk, you should have a higher risk premium. So now the holy grail question of finance is, what are the right factors? Now, there's decades of research on this question, and in the last decades, there are, I think, around 330 factors that have been proposed and published in academic journals to explain what these risk premiums are. But I think it's fair to say that we still don't know. And it's not only important to find these factors to explain why certain assets have a different price than others. It's also important when you want to make decisions about investment or how to allocate your capital. Because your investment decision models will be directly based on asset pricing models. So my work is about developing statistical methods to analyze big data sets to understand systematic risk better. So the baseline model is this type of factor model that I've written down there. So the assumption is that expected excess returns can be explained by an approximate factor model. So returns are um, percentage changes in prices. Excess returns are um, returns minus the risk-free rate. And on a quite general assumption, economic models can be formulated in this type of setup. Now, the idea is that the systematic part of the returns can be explained by factors. And some firm-specific idiosyncratic part can be explained by some residual component. Now, the idea is that most co-movements in the data should be modeled by the factor part, but the idiosyncratic part is only weakly correlated among different um, assets. Now, a typical data set has a lot of assets and a lot of time periods, but what we want to learn is from the prices, what are the factors? So we only observe returns. And we want to learn what is the, le uh, the exposure of the factors and the factor structure. Now I'm giving you two examples of how we can approach this problem. One is about how can we estimate the factors that actually matter for explaining prices. The second is how can we learn more about how these factors change over time when we use high frequency data. So if you use this baseline model, you can estimate a covariance matrix for your data. This will be a very large matrix, and it will be a random matrix. And this matrix can be decomposed into two parts. One is the part due to the factors. That's the systematic part, systematic risk part. And one is the covariance part due to this idiosyncratic firm-specific risk. And on the relatively weak assumptions, the largest eigenvalue of your random matrix will be driven by these factors. Now, the state-of-the-art approach to extract latent factors is to use principal component analysis. So roughly speaking, you can link the eigenvectors of the largest eigenvalues to your factors. Now, using this approach is ignoring all the information that might be in the first moment of your data. So as, if you remember, what I'm really caring about is explaining differences in prices. And that's essentially equivalent to explaining differences in expected excess returns. 
Now, under very weak assumptions, expected excess return should be completely described by the factors and the exposure to the factors. Now, I would like to use information contained in the first moment to get better estimates for the factors. And actually, I want to use the information that we really care about to estimate my factors. So the idea is not only to figure out factors that explain co-movement in the data, but also at the same time explain differences in expected excess returns. So what is, how does the approach work? So essentially, it's like applying principal component analysis, but including a penalty term. So whenever a factor is not very good at explaining differences in expected excess returns, you, you use a penalty for this um, kind of statistical factor. Now, roughly speaking, I'm looking for factors with a high Sharpe ratio. What is a Sharpe ratio? A Sharpe ratio is a risk-adjusted expected payoff. So finance theory says that if we can find the factors with the high Sharpe ratios, we also know the factors that are best for explaining prices. And to give you some intuition of what I can do with my approach, I can sh I use a very large data set, and I'm extracting six factors. And if I use what people do nowadays, PCA, the highest Sharpe ratio that I can get with my factors is only half as large as what I can get with my approach. Now, in industry, the pharma French factor model is very famous. Now, it has grown from a three-factor model to a five-factor model. I'm generous. I'm putting in a six-factor, the pharma French five-factor model, a momentum factor. I'm just comparing what kind of risk-adjusted payoff can you obtain with this kind of factor model. Again, it's only half as large as what I can get. Now, I want to use different um, numbers that are maybe more, um, give a better intuition. And now I'm going to use this here. I think that can be uh, it's better to read. So when you choose factors that explain excess returns, you can also use these factors to design some kind of investment strategy. <coughs> Let's assume that in July 63, you invest $1 and you buy government bonds. So it is a risk-free investment, approximately. So after every month, you get interest. You reinvest your $1 in the interest that you've earned. After 50 years, you have earned $12. Well, you can do better by buying a market index. So if you buy an S&P 500 index, after 50 years, you would have around $130. That's good. So Pharma French have shown that the size of a company and the book to market ratio are um, important risk factors. So size is measured by the market capitalization of a company and the book value is the accounting value of a company relative to the um, market value as measured by the stock price. Now, if you take an investment that is a portfolio of small firms and under-evaluated firms, these are firms that have a, a high book-to-market ratio, and you readjust your portfolio every year. You start with $1. After 50 years, you have $3,500. So that seems to be a better strategy. Now, if you use the factors that I am estimating, you do the same, you would end up with around $11,000 after 50 years. Mm -hmm. Now, so I don't want to tell you how to make money. That's not the goal. <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to illustrate here is I think I can explain or understand how prices differ among assets much better than the certain benchmark assets. And that's the purpose of this picture here. Now, this was project number one. Project number two is about understanding how systematic factors can change over time. So here I'm combining high-frequency statistics with large-dimensional factor modeling and random matrix theory. And the key idea here is that if I have all this data, this high-frequency data, and nowadays I observe millisecond trading data for thousands of companies, I can use very short time horizons to estimate the systematic factor structure. I can use this short time horizons to independently estimate my factor structure and to analyze how it changes over time. So that's what I'm going to do here. So I've developed this uh, statistical approach, and I'm applying it also empirically. I'm using the S&P 500 companies. You've, I use five minute prices for 10 years of data. And let's see what I can get. So roughly speaking, the result is so one nice thing about using high frequency data is I can split up my return data into continuous movements and into jumps. So continuous movements are like normal time movements, 
and jumps are large, sudden, big movements which can capture tail risk. And so I can show that continuous factor risk is different from jump factor risk. We look at the continuous part, it seems like, or I find strong evidence that four factors are sufficient to explain most of the co-movement in the data. And um, the top plot shows you how the prices develop for all 500 assets. The middle part shows you the systematic movement, which I can extract. The lower one is just showing you what is left over, and there doesn't seem to be any systematic pattern left anymore. Now, if I do the same with the jump data, I can show that one jump factor, is namely a market jump factor, can capture almost all the systematic co jumps in the data. Now, I can do one thing more. I can actually put a label on what the factors are. So I've developed this estimation technique to, to test what factors are and how we can link them with economic variables. And I can show that the factors that I'm extracting are a market factor, an oil price factor, a finance factor, an electricity factor. And so then my, my motivation for analyzing this data was to understand what kind of time variation do I have in the factor structure. And I can show that the factor structure is quite stable over time. So if you look at 2003 to 2006, you have three factors, and this factor structure is stable. 2007, when the financial crisis started, a finance factor appears. And after that, we have four factors until 2012. And I mentioned before, the jump factors are different from the continuous factors. So a one factor model describes the jumps very well. And I'm also going further by, uh, by studying how is the volatility factor structure and what's the correlation between the volatility factors and my return factors, etc. cetera. 